Welcome everyone uh, to this Public Philosophy Network workshop on how to write uh, philosophy op-eds. Um, the philosophy, uh, Public Philosophy Network uh, is committed to supporting philosophers who are engaged in addressing issues of public concern, healthcare, uh, economics, um, uh, any number of uh, public policies. Uh, and we do that through uh, workshops like this that are skill building workshops um, that hopefully will inspire and equip uh, many of you to contribute your own philosophical expertise uh, to the pressing issues of our day. No doubt uh, the virus will be one that many people will be writing about uh, for some time. Uh, and submitting that to um, publications um, uh, like magazines and newspapers and online journals and the like. Um, we have a stellar lineup of presenters today um, who are going to discuss what editors are looking for and what they're not looking for, uh, the difference between scholarly and public writing, how news cycles work, uh, how to pitch an op-ed, and uh, how to generate ideas for public writing. Uh, and I'll just uh, say to Jason that his tweet about the, the necessity of grad students uh, learning this kind of public uh, writing really inspired uh, uh, this workshop. So I'm happy that he is uh, here to share with us uh, uh, his own insights on it. So I also wanna thank my co-host Ian. Uh, he's been indispensable in helping make this workshop uh, a reality. So I really appreciate it. So Ian, do you wanna introduce our first speaker if David is here? Sure, I'm actually, I'm looking through the list of participants and I'm not seeing David at the moment. Uh, so <laughs> maybe we can, well, I'll read this introduction very slowly and we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah, sure, we can do that. Unless, well, actually, no, why don't we stick to the schedule and I'll just, I'll introduce David and we can wait for him to show up and then if he doesn't show up in a few minutes. So, uh, David Johnson is deputy editor for print at Stanford Social Innovation Review. He's a former philosophy professor turned journalist with more than a decade of experience as an editor and writer. Previously, he was senior opinion editor at Al Jazeera America, where he edited the op-ed section of the news channel's website. Earlier in his career, he served as online editor at Boston Review and research editor at San Francisco Magazine, the year it won a National Magazine Award for general excellence. He's written for the New York Times, USA Today, the New Republic, Book Forum, Eon, Descent, and The Baffler, among other publications. He's taught at Stanford University, the University of Michigan, and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. David earned a PhD in philosophy from Stanford University, a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University, a master's degree in classics from Cambridge University, and a bachelor's degree in philosophy and history from the University of California, Berkeley. He lives in Berkeley. Now I'm going to check the list of participants to see if he was able to. Yes, uh, I'm it. here. Here we go. My video isn't working, but I'm okay, here. here. Why don't I turn that on for you? Um, <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us. Take, take it away. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry. Are you gonna uh, are you gonna introduce the other participants, or should I? Start oh, I'm here? sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, we did a little introduction, and a uh, and I just introduced you and and read your read your bio just a moment ago. So I, I you're, we're ready to go when when you are. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about the confusion. I actually missed where the link to the invitation. So sorry okay. about that. It's okay. You think I'd know Zoom by now? <laughs> so, anyways, well, thank you everybody for uh, for coming. Uh, so I guess I was asked to talk about what I look for uh, in philosophy op-eds when I get pitches. Um, I not only work for the Stanford Social Innovation Review, but I also edit part-time for the APA blog, where I publish, you know, among other things, opinion essays at the APA blog. Uh, so I wrote down a couple points that I always keep in mind when I field submissions. The one question, there, the pair of questions that every editor at a publication asks that you should keep in mind is why us and why now? Why is this uh, submission suitable for my publication or my audience? And why should my readers want to read this now? 
Um, so uh, as somebody who wants to pitch an outlet uh, to write a philosophy op-ed, you should always be thinking, what magazine is this? What is its mission? What is its readership? And why do readers of that magazine or publication want to read my thoughts now? Um, you might offer a great historical interpretation of Descartes, uh, but somebody can read that on the Stanford, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, at their convenience. Why would they want to read your thoughts about Descartes right now? Do you have, does he have something to say to the current moment that uh, my readers want to read? So always keep that in mind that your piece should be timely and suited to the audience that reads that publication. Uh, second, a very common question, a, a common confusion editors identifying pitches is the difference between a topic and an idea or a topic and an argument. Um, oftentimes you'll read a pitch and, you're, and what, what the editor thinks is, well, this is an interesting topic, but I actually don't know what you want to write or what you want to argue. If you want to write about Arendt and the origins of totalitarianism, that's fine. That's a nice topic, but what are you going to say about it? How are you gonna apply it to the current moment? Um, so always keep in mind that you wanna be pitching an idea and an argument, not simply a topic. Third, uh, and this might sound obvious to and it tautological to people, but when we're talking about a philosophical op-ed, I want the op-ed to be philosophical. And it might sound obvious, but what I mean by that is I want the op-ed to show philosophical thinking, philosophical activity engaged in the problem that's being discussed. Uh, I don't want a summary of what past philosophers thought. Um, Aristotle, I did ancient Greek philosophy. I find Aristotle and Plato very interesting, but why do I care about what they have to say right now? Why do I want to read another op-ed that appeals to Plato? Well, it's because in the op-ed, I want to see that you're philosophically engaged. You might be applying some concepts from Plato, or want to see some philosophy going on, some arguing, some fine distinctions, some clarifications that'll help readers understand something because you're doing philosophy with the reader and helping them think philosophically. That's presumably why we want philosophers to write op-eds and to contribute to public discourse. Um, I would also say on this that I think opinion essays that are philosophical in this way, that show philosophical engagement, philosophical thinking, are more interesting. Um, you know, I don't want to read a academic philosophical paper when I'm reading an op-ed, say in the Stone or the New York Times, but I do want to see some real philosophical engagement. It's more interesting. It's what makes philosophy interesting. So when you want to write a philosophy op-ed, you should really bring your philosophy hat to your writing and really think like a philosopher. Try to get the reader engaged the way you do in the classroom when you try to get your students engaged in real philosophical thinking. Um, also on this point, I would say that writing a philosophical essay in this way gives you standing. And what I mean by that, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, very popular publications like the New York Times, editors want to know why should readers hear about you or hear from you about this topic? Uh, well, if you're writing a philosophical op-ed, it's because you're a philosopher. You have a PhD in philosophy, you've written books on philosophy, you think philosophically, and so that gives you standing. Uh, it makes you a more credible person to write about it than, say, an average Joe in the law school. <laughs> Um, so you should especially uh, think about your standing when you're pitching a publication. Why is it that they should think of me to write this rather than somebody else? Because uh, an editor can always say, well, that's a nice submission that you've given me, but I could have, I could have Daniel Dennett write it. Why should I listen to you? Uh, so you should always have that in mind. Like, what is my standing? Why am I a good person to write about this? Uh, Two final points I want to make. Uh, always remember that you're writing for an audience and not a reviewer. Oftentimes, because we're in the practice as academic philosophers of writing for a reviewer for an academic journal or a, or a, book, pub, a book publisher, we're thinking about, oh my gosh, what are all the objections that this reviewer might have? And what are all the other citations I need to mention 
in order to persuade this reviewer that I'm the person to write this and this is worth publishing. Uh, you're not writing for a reviewer, you're writing for an audience. Uh, and the audience will not bring all these objections to mind necessarily right at the beginning of your essay. They want to be engaged. They want to, they want to follow you, uh, follow the course of your thinking from the beginning to the end. So you have to be compelling and you don't have to think in terms of how am I convince this other expert in my field who's a reviewer that I know what I'm talking about. You, you just need to be engaged with the audience. Uh, and, uh, uh, an audience that reads that publication, whatever publication we're talking about. Fi uh, finally, the last point I wanted to make is editors generally across the board care about writing. They care about writerly chops. Um, so just uh, <clears throat> apart from whatever philosophical skill you have in, in making clear distinctions and offering arguments and thinking philosophically, we want to publish people who write well, who people like to read. And so I think as you try to practice the craft of writing philosophy op-eds, you should really try to cultivate your writing style, cultivate your, your writerly chops, and maybe take chances because in writing a philosophy op-ed, you'll be working with an editor and the editor will help you uh, become a better writer. And you should try to take chances that you wouldn't necessarily take when you're uh, writing an academic journal paper or giving a presentation at a conference. So try to cultivate yourself as a writer the way you would if you were trying to write good fiction or a good short story. Um, so that's all the points I wanted to offer and happy to yield the floor. Thank you so much. So we're gonna use uh, the chat window for the question and answer sessions here. So it, I'm sure it'll take a second for questions to come in because people have to type them. But uh, you can type your questions and comments into, into the chat and, and we'll, uh, we'll queue them up from there. Um, maybe while we're waiting for, <laughs> while, while we're waiting for some of those uh, uh, questions to start coming in, I'll, I'll pose one. Um, I, I wonder whether editors sort of expect philosophers to sort of t have a broader kind of time horizon in their writing, like whether wh on the one hand you want some sort of current events peg, but on the other hand, like do editors expect philosophers to sort of connect uh, current events to sort of broader trends in history or sort of loft loftier ideas? Um, well, first of all, I think, they want you to be timely. They want to, to write something that an audience right now wants to read. Um, and they, want, they don't want you to overextend yourself so that you're getting into things you don't know that well. So it's like, why are you the person to write about this? For example, Jason Stanley, who will write later, has been writing and thinking a lot lately about fascism and about the history of fascism. Well, you might not think a philosopher would write about the history of fascism, but he's actually done a hell of a lot of research and he's written a book on the topic. So he has standing to address those issues. So you wanna be careful about what you're extending yourself to um, and what standing you have to write, to talk about it. Um, are you talking about just general historic facts that everyone knows? Are you talking about really complex issues that maybe historians or people in other fields know better? Have you done your homework? Um, is what I would say to that. Okay, great. So we're so we're starting to get. We've got a bunch of questions in the chat so far. I'll just uh, note for questioners that uh, Lee McIntyre is going to be speaking about uh, pitching in a little bit. But um, but I think it's, I think it's okay to take some questions about uh, pitching for now. So uh, Joanna writes. Uh, Joanna Spolensky writes. What should the structure of a pitch look like? How do you know who to contact with your pitch at a given publication? So two things on that. On the structure of a pitch, try to get your point in in the first paragraph or even the first sentence. Um, because think of yourself, if you're an editor, you're getting lots of submissions over email. Your email inbox is overflowing with pitches. And so they don't wanna take extra time to read to the end of your pitch to figure out what it is you wanna write. They wanna get it pretty quickly. So you should think about the title, even the, like the, the subject line of your email, uh, flagging that it's a submission and really getting to like the title that you would think is best for the, for the piece you wanna write and really get to the point in the first paragraph. 
Uh, and then also towards, if you're typically a, a pitch shouldn't be longer than a page, could be a couple paragraphs, two or three, uh, maybe three paragraphs. Um, at the end, the last paragraph, you should say why you're the person to write it. So like, I want, uh, I'm, uh, philosopher at this university, or I have a PhD in this, or I've written a book on this. So you want to convince, you, you, you're checking a box that says you're the person to write this. <clears throat> in terms of who to contact, you should try to avoid any general submission uh, email that goes to an inbox that's only read by interns at the publication in question. Uh, you should instead try to uh, address a specific editor by name at that publication. That can sometimes be hard if the publication doesn't have the emails of the editors available on its website. But then uh, in that case, I would try to find somebody, uh, maybe another philosopher who's written for that publication and, and ask that person, oh, do you have a contact at that publication? Who, who was your editor there? Do you mind if you share that person's contact? Always try to make a personal address to a specific editor at the publication. Uh, great. So uh, Nathaniel asks, what does it mean to take chances, unquote? Can you give an example? Um, what I mean by that is, I was talking about writerly chances. That is trying to show some flair in your writing. And uh, writing is a practice that takes uh, a lot of work. And the first, time, the first time you take a chance at a sentence may be a bad attempt. And you may not know that until somebody points it out or you read it out loud or the editor says that that sentence doesn't quite work. Um, what I mean by that is just uh, try to not think of yourself the way you write when you're writing an academic journal paper or presentation at the APA conference, but rather just write the way you would talk to your friends and family about the topic. Try to be engaging, interesting. Um, or take risks even, um, where I, I personally feel when I write an opinion essay, I like to be working with an editor who's gonna rein me in and I'm just gonna try to push the envelope knowing that the person will rein me back. <laughs> um, it makes it more fun as a writer and also makes for more engaging prose. Um, so I guess that just means, uh, writing sentences using styles that you wouldn't necessarily use in an academic paper. Great. Um, I think we have one more time for a, for a quick question. Uh, this, is, this is pretty quick. When pitching, do you expect the whole piece or pitch and then a brief opening paragraph to establish style? So like how, how much of a piece should be included in a pitch? I think it tends to um, vary depending on the publication. Sometimes, uh, and uh, sometimes a publication wants to see the whole essay before they make a decision. Um, I think to save your time, if you haven't written the essay, you should write the pitch first. And the pitch can be just the first couple paragraphs of the piece itself. And then you can note, well, I, and I've written and I'm happy to share it with you if you're interested. Um, uh, if you haven't written it, then just try to write the first couple paragraphs and that'll give a sense if, if, the, if the editor wants it, they want to see the whole thing. They want to know like what comes after this. So I'll ask you to, to write it up. Um, uh, so uh, I would say if you, if you haven't written a piece, just try to include the first couple paragraphs. Okay, great. It, it is 420, so I think that's our time. But David, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. This is great. We have, I should say, we have a bunch of questions, which, you know, I think this is kind of inevitable that we'll have a bunch of questions that we're not able to get to in the Q&A. Uh, uh, maybe I can make this, these questions available to the speakers afterwards. And if you have, a, if you have the time to address some of them, you can. And if you don't, then, then you don't. But uh, yeah, again, thank you very much, David. Um, let's move on to our second speaker now. So, um, Jason Stanley is the Jacob Urowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. He's the author of five books, including Knowledge and Practical Interests, winner of the 2007 American Philosophical Association Book Prize, How Propaganda Works, winner of the Prose Award in Philosophy from the Association of American Publishers, and How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. 
His forthcoming book with David Beaver is Hustle, Language as Politics. Stanley serves on the board of the Prison Policy Initiative and writes frequently about propaganda, free speech, mass incarceration, democracy, and authoritarianism for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Guardian. Um, so, Jason, take it away. Thank you. Now, uh, David, uh, as to be expected, covered a lot of the ground that I was going to cover, so I will probably cover some of the ground that subsequent speakers will cover. And bear in mind that, you know, as Jerry Fodor uh, emphasizes, those who can do can, are not always the people who can explain what to do. Um, and so, uh, so um, uh, knowing how is, is knowing a bunch of instructions, but there's a different set of instructions for uh, explaining how to do something. So, um, so talk about, I've been assigned the topic of the relationship between scholarly writing and writing and public writing. Uh, I'm to assume, as David did, that you'll be writing philosophy op-eds specifically. I think we philosophers have certain talents, uh, certain benefits from our philosophy training. And we also, of course, have certain terrible um, uh, 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 disabilities from our philosophy training that you have to unlearn. And I think that, uh, but I think that we can, we can marshal uh, our, our talents, the virtues of our field uh, that our training gives us uh, to write on a wide variety of topics. Uh, you know, bearing in mind David's absolutely correct point that you know, your scholarship needs to back it up. Uh, so, um, so just a few, so I'm gonna be really riffing off of David's points here. Um, so just uh, a few points about writing. So my, my uh, in a philosophy article, this is what I try to do. I don't know what you try to do. I try to crush the referee under the weight of argument and crush the reader under the weight of argument. I say what my thesis is, I give an argument for my thesis, I repeat, I, I go through objections, um, you know, crush them, and then, you know, repeat my argument, repeat how I showed what I was going to show, you know, repeat. So none of that is, is applicable to public writing. You are not trying to browbeat your reader into submission. That is not, <laughs> uh, so, so, and unfortunately that, that is, uh, so, uh, so you just have to unlearn that and it's hard to unlearn. My agent, my literary agent has a phrase for when I slip back into that. She calls it vertical writing. Premise one, premise two, premise three. When I first submitted my manuscript uh, a manu for how fascism works, or some and sometimes when I've, I've submitted work, um, but so this certainly happened with my editor for how fascism works for Penguin Random House, she was completely freaked out by my writing. She, she's like, she said, uh, what is this sort of like, uh, you know, one, two, three, four thing? <laughs> and so don't do that. We're trained to do that. We're trained to be, you know, premise, premise, conclusion. That is not how you write for a public. You need to retain the interest of the reader. Uh, learning how to do that is a, is, is, is a, takes a while. And, and for op-eds, uh, you know, it has to happen very quickly. Um, there are some, uh, there are, there are some uh, other features to, uh, to, I mean, I, this is going to be covered, the news cycle. I mean, I submitted a piece yesterday uh, that got uh, rejected from the New York Times and it's like floating at other places, but it's about Brazil and, and, and COVID and, and, uh, and India and, he, and, and Trump as well and so it's very news sensitive so you know i'm and like what's happening like right now in brazil is going to impact like what i say so that's not something you're used to uh, as an academic and so it's very different from scholarly writing um so things happen very quickly uh so uh so you have to be aware that you need to write uh in it you know it's not like six months waiting for comments um so, uh, so 
let me address the topic I was assigned, scholarly writing and public writing. Uh, and I'm gonna address it in a narrative way. Um, so I was, first, uh, I was first asked to write, and, and I think, by the way, the New York Times is changing, the stone isn't as regular, it's not clear the stone will always be around, so it's not clear there will be a venue for straight philosophy writing. Um, uh, you might need to bend your writing to events, to issues, uh, which is not bad because every other country has public intellectuals, philosophers, I mean, who, philosophers who are public intellectuals who use their philosophical training to bear on public and current issues. So what I did uh, when I first started writing for the public, my first piece was uh, my first piece was for the Stone in 2011, uh, and it was on birtherism. Um, so it was on conspiracy theories, the birther conspiracy theory. My second piece was on Fox News. So uh, so I was worried about propaganda, and I was a philosopher of language and epistemologist. That's my background training. That's what I do. Um, and, and, and I thought, okay, I'm really interested in propaganda. That's kind of why in college I started doing philosophy of language in the first place. Um, so, uh, so what I had to do is I had to mesh my teaching and my scholarly work to what I was writing for the public. So for instance, for the past five years, I've been teaching on fascism and authoritarianism. Um, I've been teaching because my public writing is on that. Um, so, uh, but... I started off by appealing to the things that I knew in my scholarly work, appealing to philosophy of language, appealing to epistemology, appealing to, if you look at my first piece on birtherism, I, I use Ray Langton and Hornsby on silencing and McKinnon on silencing. Um, so I used what I knew from my scholarly work. And then as I've become more drawn upon in the public sphere to speak about propaganda, fascism, authoritarianism. My scholarly work has just, you know, I mean, uh, I teach language and power every year. I teach a course on propaganda and, uh, and fascism every year. Uh, I, you know, my scholarly work has had to change uh, because when I'm called on in the public sphere to speak about an issue, um, I have to have, as David pointed out, standing. And that is going to require a change in, in, in my scholarly work and has over the past 10 years. Uh, fortunately, I think, uh, thanks to the, the work of, of folks like Ian um, and many of you here uh, and Rena and, and, and many of my fellow speakers, uh, uh, Lee McIntyre, and the, the field has changed along with that. Now, you know, at the APA, there are many talks on propaganda and, uh, and misinformation and these talks. Uh, it's a, it, so... So I think that as we enter the public sphere, as you enter the public sphere, it will change your scholarly work. It will. It just will. You not, can't be writing for uh, the Washington Post on a topic and not have spent the semester reading up on all the literature, teaching, being immersed in it. Um, almost all of my work, my fascism book, was written as course notes for my propaganda, ideology, and democracy class. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so it will change your scholarly work, but the hive mind and philosophy works in this weird way that, you know, a lot of us started doing this bridge work uh, as the world needed it. Um, so let me just, let, let me end. Um, so, so, so that is on the topic that I've been asked to, 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 to speak about the, you know, I mean, rigid designation and contextualism and epistemology uh, you know, uh, knowing how and knowing that. I mean, I think those are vital issues and I'm sure they're of central public import. Uh, and they are, they are. <laughs> but uh, but uh, your, uh, when you write for the papers, it will change your scholarly work. And that is not a bad thing. Uh, that is not a bad thing. Uh, and you need to trust that the field of philosophy, especially as public philosophy has become a more, central and more recognized uh, topics, top, uh, topic. In fact, Lewis Gordon and I were the uh, president and, and uh, chair and vice chair of the APA Public Philosophy Committee. We're right now drafting a document on how to incorporate public philosophy into tenure decisions. So as public philosophy becomes more and more of a recognized thing, and as the older generations 
uh, resistance, older even than me, re resistance to it fades, uh, it's going to, uh, it, it, there's going to be more of a back and forth between the scholarly work and the, uh, the, uh, the public work. I mean, I am deeply involved in scholarship about nationalism in different versions of nationalism and going to teach a course on it with a history professor. Uh, but, you know, and I'm writing papers on it, but they have lots of footnotes. But that's because of what I'm working on in the public domain. And that will happen to you too. And you just have to trust that philosophy will move uh, along with you. Um, uh, so, uh, so finally, uh, don't, uh, don't worry. I think we have an advantage uh, uh, in philosophy over uh, even the more literary fields. You will have to learn to write in a more concise literary style. But for example, analytic philosophy, we always had, you know, a, you know uh, there, was, there was kind of an ethic of speaking of clarity. I mean, Chomsky, I think, his public writing embodies that, Angela Davis as well. Uh, I think of them as analytic, as, as um, similar training to me. Um, so Bertrand Russell. So, uh, so, that, so use that to your favor, to write in a way that, uh, that doesn't use the fancy theoretical terms. Okay, I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, one comes from Roman Altschuler. He writes, how do you deal with new sensitive topics? If you write a new sensitive uh, article and pitch it to the NYT or WAPO or wherever, they expect you not to submit it elsewhere for a few days. Uh, if you uh, do, uh, you, you, know, you lose your window. Is there a way around that? No. Uh, and uh, no, there isn't. And you just have to be really you, I mean, I have story after story about the hours that matter, you know, uh, times where I've missed a window after the Squirrel Hill shooting and, uh, you know, where, where you're offered a big thing to write and, you know, you just have given a window and, uh, and you just need to be able, you know, there's many nights where I, you know, I, I start a piece at 11 p.m. It has to be in by 8 a.m., uh, the news cycle works entirely differently. And if you don't have two days anymore, you have three hours. You don't have two days. Good. I think we have time for one, one more question before we turn to Olivia. So um, uh, GK writes, on op-eds changing scholarly work, do you encourage your students to write op-eds as part of their assessment? My graduate students or my undergraduates? Uh, that's a, it's a good question. I think I, you know, I think I will increasingly turn to encouraging graduate students to do public work and graduate students who want to work with me uh, uh, more and more want to come to Yale. They want to come to Yale because they might want to work with Robin Demberoff or me. Uh, you know, they write, uh, they're a public philosopher as well. They do public philosophy. So I think it's just going to be, you know, years ago, uh, there was a question years ago about how much public philosophy would transform philosophy. Would it be, would it transform all of philosophy or would it just be another specialist area? And I think it's a little bit of both. Um, it's, you know, it is a specialist there, it, it, but it is also just become another specialist area. It's its own thing, its own set of skills and talents. You need the names of editors, you need to practice and writing and shop your pieces. So if you're going to do public philosophy, you want to go to a pro grad program where there are pop people in that specialist area. Okay. On that note, thank, thank you very much, Jason. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so thank you, we're going to turn to uh, Olivia Goldhill now. Um, a little introduction. Uh, Hi. Olivia Goldhill. Hey, Olivia. Olivia uh, is an investigative reporter at Quartz, where she covers philosophy and psychology. She holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Harvard University and a master's in journal journalism from City University London. In addition to her work at Quartz, her writing can be found in The Telegraph, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Financial Times, and elsewhere. Uh, Olivia, take it away. Okay, hi. I hope my video works okay. Um, apologies if it doesn't. And yes, uh, apologies also if I seem a bit frazzled. I am on my own tight deadline, so I'll be going after this to finish that. Um, and I'm talking about uh, news cycles and time pitch. Yes, yeah, so in journalism, they are a lot quicker than in academia. Uh, since I'm a starter, um, if there is breaking news, also, and if you want to flag, if I cut out, I can change rooms, um, but I'll keep going. Um, so yeah, as 
self-reporter, uh, if there's something breaking news, you know, I'll be assigned it and I, I'll just have a couple of hours to write it and publish it. Um, and then constantly balancing that with um, slightly longer, more in-depth projects. Um, for freelance, it kind of varies on if you have a pre-established relationship with an editor um, and then they might go to you regularly, they know that you're quick and that you're available and can ask you to write a piece very quickly if something is very timely. Um, but if you're just starting out, that's much less likely. So I think you have to think about slightly longer timeframes. Um, an editor that is going to be accepting freelance pitches is going to be inundated. Uh, so it takes a long time. They have to take, get all the pitches, they have to read through all of them, commission them, edit them, and so forth. And so if you are a freelance philosopher, uh, not a freelance philosopher, if you're a philosopher and doing kind of freelance reading for any publication, it's going to be, I think, difficult if you're too timely and too closely timed to some very specific event. Uh, so I was trying to think of examples for them. Um, I, think, I think it's best to think about so when you're pitching, to think about something that will still be interesting to readers a week from when you pitch. If that's kind of uh, to an editor, I think that's a kind of reasonable timeline from when you pitch and to when it publishes. So for example, um, a very, very timely uh, philosophy story, you may still be interested in it a week from now, but other people might have forgotten about it. So I was thinking about Marco Rubio said that welders wake, make more than philosophers and we need more welders than philosophers. Um, there was plenty of very quick analysis about that and philosophers writing in response quite soon. But if you don't know someone and you know you pitch a piece and it takes a while to come out, a week later, a lot of other readers, I mean, there's so much at the moment, but in general, are forgotten about it and it could seem a little out of date. So I think if you're starting out, my advice would be to think about um, articles that are gonna be interesting and relevant a week from when you first pitch. Um, and the, the biggest piece of advice I would have is uh, don't pitch, uh, if you see a, a publication writing a, a specific article that you think is interesting, don't pitch the same article, or don't kind of advertise the article as highly similar to that one, which is the vast majority of uh, pitches that we get sent from um, PRs, which is not their fault, I it's just the way the industry works um, but people will say I saw you wrote this article if you do it again I can talk about it and of course you know if you've already published that article no editor is going to want to do it again you're going to be looking for whatever is new um, so I would say um, it makes sense to you know obviously if a uh, publication is writing about philosophy that generally is just as in the field but to think about questions that haven't been asked yet um, rather than kind of I can give a different approach to that same article. It's all about kind of looking forward and what's happening next. Um, so I mean I think this current period we're in coronavirus is quite well suited to uh, philosophy articles and the kind of philosophy articles I was talking about where they're not overly timely. I mean there are huge issues at the moment that are going to be relevant for, for weeks and months. Um, so, you know, one that I did was on uh, the uh, different, different ways of answering the question of um, who, who should get treatment first um, when hospitals are kind of inundated and can't treat every coronavirus uh, patient. And um, that is a question that hospitals unfortunately are dealing with, they're going to be keep dealing with, and that there are several, you know, ethical theories that respond to it. Um, I mean, then there, you know, who should be tested first? Should you order delivery? Um, there are just so many ethical issues at the moment that I think philosophers could weigh in on and are both timely without, you know, going to be quickly losing relevance. Um, and I think you don't have to, you don't have to be overly wedded to the news. You know, you don't have to be writing about coronavirus. But it is important to recognize the situation, have some awareness of the situation that people, that readers are in and that some relevance is good. So for example, uh, courts had commissioned um, a series on over tourism that we have canceled for obvious reasons. Over tourism isn't happening at the moment. It would, it would look quite insensitive. Um, 
So I think kind of philosophical perspectives on uh, ways to get through coronavirus, you know, lessons that we can draw from, you know, the many uh, philosophical writings on plagues and pandemics and what that says about life in general. All of those are, are kind of, even if you're not directly talking about a coronavirus, very relevant to the situation that people are in. Um, and I also think uh, a huge number of philosophy articles I know is talking about news cycles, but a lot of philosophy articles that get published are somewhat evergreen, meaning they're not tied to the news cycle. And I think there's there's a huge readership for that, a lot of interest in it, and I don't see it going away. So kind of the big uh, quest, not even, I say big questions, but you know, when you're writing an article, it always has to be specific. Um, but you know questions about how the mind works or relationships or um finding meaning that uh people have been writing about for centuries and will keep writing about and that you don't have to kind of artificially wed it to a news event um so yeah that is my kind of summary of uh news cycles and you know how to how to respond to them and be timing and i can take questions or Great. Yeah, uh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Um, so we have one question from August Gorman who writes, uh, in your opinion, how narrow of an argument is preferred by editors for op-eds? Is there room to say, raise a family of related critical questions for a contemporary trend while drawing critical distinctions along the way? Or should it be focused on one particular critical question where you offer a clear answer? Mm. Yeah, really good question. Um, I Look, there's going to be caveats and exceptions, but as a general rule, specificity is so important in journalism. I mean, you know, for every article you write, there's, there's going to be an angle, there's going to be a specific point. And I always kind of, I think that is a big difference between journalism and academia. Um, I mean, one thing that journalists think about is you never want to write about a topic. A topic, is, you know, when you're trying to cover the entire field and, you know, there are just endless questions and, and issues and counterpoints. And, you know, that's wonderful for uh, an encyclopedia entry or for uh, maybe a journal article perhaps, but a journalism article really should kind of lead with a central argument. And you can definitely, I mean, draw in some of the other issues or kind of highlight, you know, uh, highlight that that this isn't going to be this isn't going to completely answer every related um, question in the field but i i would encourage kind of having a main argument and then making those questions a little bit smaller i mean the one i sometimes think about is um you know lots of people don't think string theory is valid but you can't have every single journalism article in string theory kind of putting in all those caveats you have to draw a line somewhere and in journalism i think it's best to be specific Okay, great. Um, we have a question from GK who writes on different approaches to the same article, perhaps different angles slash arguments are okay as opposed to different topics. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so they can be. I would just bear in mind that them, and again, there are exceptions, but there might be less interest, you know, um, in that you've already, I mean, there are always comments, but you've already covered that topic and you've covered that question. Um, I mean, yes, if there's a completely different perspective with kind of very different conclusions, um, then there might well be interest in doing it. But I wouldn't, I think it's going to be more exciting for an editor to hear of a topic that they haven't already covered and that is really pressing and demands coverage. Um, I mean, you do see, look, you know, someone will do an article and then there'll be a, a, a counterpoint um, and, you know, people refuting the main ideas. It does happen. Um, and I, I think it can be very important, especially if, you know, the first article, um, you know, facts evolve and change and maybe the first article, you know, didn't respond to the situation, it wasn't accurately reflecting the situation as it um, develops. But um, I just don't know. Uh, I wouldn't lead with that as kind of um, the, the best way to, as in, you've already covered this, I can cover it a different way. I would kind of just say, 
here's my totally different um, argument and thought, and I think it, it could be really valuable for your publication. So yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a place for it, but um, uh, I would just bear in mind that a, a lot of editors are getting pictures um, saying, I can cover the article that you already did slightly differently, and um, it may not get as strong of a response. Um, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give myself a question because I don't see one in the queue. Um, I think you've, you're, you're very skilled at like finding a philosophical angle on current sort of current events uh, and turning around, turning around articles pretty quickly. I mean, is there anything sort of practically to say about like how you read the news or do you just sort of sit around and wait for ideas to come to you? I mean, like how, how, you know, how, how, how do you sort of cultivate the skill of, of finding the angle? Yeah. Um, I can say, I don't know how useful it will be if you're not a journalist. So, cause, uh, I have to consume a lot and I have, um, RSS feeds with just like endless amounts, uh, of news coming in that I can, I can summarize and read very quickly. And I guess, um, I mean, to me, it kind of feels, this isn't useful because I was going to say it feels obvious, you know, there's so much going on and so many of them will relate to philosophical um, ideas that, you know, because there aren't that many um, journalists writing about this, it's, there's just so much room to cover it. Um, in terms of kind of useful and how, uh, like, I think when you see something happening in uh, contemporary life and you're like, ah, oh, this, this relates so perfectly to, um, you know, X theory that was put forward however many centuries ago. I mean, I, um, I love that. And I think readers are fascinated in that and fascinated in, in drawing on the lessons and applying them today. So, and that's something I would just instinctively keep an eye out for. Um, in terms of tips for coming out with angles, the, yeah, the, I, I, I guess my general advice for academics is uh, a lot of academia, uh, I think people are trying to impress each other with their own intelligence and, you know, with their long words. And journalism's kind of opposite of that. You know, you want simple, straightforward words. You want, you're trying to capture people's attention. You know, there's so many articles going along and you want them to read yours. So you don't want to be uh, jargon heavy at all. Um, so I think whatever idea you have, you should be able to kind of say it in a sentence, a short sentence to someone with no background in philosophy, and they should be interested in being like, what, what is that? Tell me more. Um, kind of any kind of theme, you know, like, oh yes, that sounds very, um, you know, significant and insightful. Uh, it, it might, I don't know, it could be a little too, um, not highbrow because journalism can be highbrow, but it, it, it could just be like not quite snappy enough. So uh, I would encourage you to kind of think about how to make your ideas appeal to people um, who have no academic background. Um, great. So GK writes, well, actually, there's a, there's a there's a there's a discussion going on in the chat about how to manage like very small word counts by academic standards, uh, like how to how to have a productive like philosophical discussion in the space of 800 words. Um, do you have uh, do you have any sort of models or like exemplars of like things that you think are sort of really, really excellent examples of very short form philosophical writing or um, yeah, this, this is putting on the spot a little bit. It's hard to come up yeah. with examples all the time. But, but. Um, I mean, like, uh, I can't think of a specific article at the top of my head, but I will say, you know, Brain Pickings um, is doing kind of really great work, I think, where they, you know, just she takes little snippets of um, philosophical ideas and gives them a, a sentence of two context. Um, and people love reading what she does. And I think that's just a great example of, you know, you're taking one point and making it relevant. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of like a, a go-to um, simple example. I do, you know, there's a, a, a writer at the Irish Times who does a lot of um, philosophy writing and is, is pretty straight and to the point. Um, and yeah, I know it's, it's, um, new and strange and different, but I guess just believing that it's possible can help. And I, I do think it's possible. I do think very complicated ideas can be kind of um, explained in a, in a 
accurate and truthful and interesting way in a short space, you're not going to get every single, um, you're not going to contain all the possible interesting relevant thoughts in the article, but I think you can, you can do the topic justice and just kind of knowing that that's possible and going back over the drafts and, and getting rid of all the superfluous words. Once you've done it a couple of times, I think you, you see how it, how it works. Great. Well, I think we have to move on to our next speaker, but Olivia, thank you so much and, and for taking time out of a very busy schedule to, to join us. Really Thanks, appreciate Olivia. it. Thanks, Olivia. So our next speaker is uh, Lee McIntyre, who will be uh, talking about pitching philosophy op-eds. Uh, Lee is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. He's the author of, among other books, Post-Truth, 2018, and The Scientific Attitude, 2019, both from IT Press. Uh, Lee, take it away. Okay. Um, can you see me, hear me, everything okay? Yep. Okay, great. All right. So... I've been asked to speak on uh, pitching a philosophy op-ed, and what I've done is uh, broken this up into uh, do's and don'ts, and I've got a, a few of each. Um, first, I wanted to say, uh, I'll do the do's first. I think that it's important for people to think of philosophy op-eds as a longer relationship than just one piece. Um, you should, uh, if you're gonna start doing philosophy op-eds, it's important to do some research on the venues. Um, and remember that your best opportunity for publishing an op-ed is to go to some place where you've published one before. So once you have a relationship with a place, it's, uh, it's easier. It's important to know what the publication wants, to actually read the publication. You'd be surprised how many people just write an op-ed on spec and send it in, and that tends not to work. You have to do your research and shape your submission to the uh, venue that, uh, that you're looking at. Um, Someone asked earlier, should you write the whole piece on spec or uh, pitch an idea? Um, and again, I think the answer given before was write it. Uh, it depends on the, uh, on the publication. One thing that I found very useful is to just be open to suggestions. Once you have built a relationship, say, with, uh, with an editor or with a publication, sometimes the editors have ideas of topics that they would like philosophers to cover. And so if you're flexible, if you're willing to write on something that they will give you, uh, that can be a, a, a terrific thing to do as well. Um, most important piece of advice I think I'm gonna give you today, one of the do's, uh, remember your audience. Um, you, you cannot write a philosophy op-ed unless you aspire to write clearly for a popular audience. And I'll guarantee you, you know enough philosophy to do this, but if you have never practiced writing for a popular audience, you don't know how to do that. And you need to, you, first you need to want to do that, and second you need to practice uh, doing that, because that is uh, normally gonna be the barrier that's gonna keep your piece from being published because you just don't know how to write for a popular audience. So read all the philosophy op-eds that you know, are in clear language that uh, you know, appeal to the general public and that will help you, but then also practice uh, doing it yourself. One thing that I found uh, very important uh, in, uh, in uh, practicing that is to read my work out loud. Uh, my ear, can hear things uh, better than uh, you know, my brain can see them. So if you're trying to see whether you've got something in the right voice, uh, do it in your voice, read it out loud to yourself, and that'll tell you whether you're writing in the right way. Or read somebody else's piece, pick a, a Frank Bruni column from the New York Times or something, just to read it out loud and see what the rhythm of the language is. It's like he's not a philosopher, but, but he writes well, and um, uh, that, will, uh, that will help you. Finally, for the do's, uh, I say think big. Uh, I think that sometimes people are intimidated when they've been writing academic philosophy for a long time to think, well, you know, what do I have to say? Well, you know, well, I'll try one of the, the smaller publications. Uh, don't. Uh, try some of the big ones. Uh, one of the first pieces I did was in the Times Higher Education Supplement, next one in the Chronicle, next one in the New York Times. You actually can do that. Um, you need to be persistent. Uh, I've also gotten rejected from all those publications. So you just have to keep uh, going after it. And once you've proven yourself, uh, it can get easier. Um, I'll give you a very practical piece of advice. One of the best places to start 
um, is a an online publication called The Conversation. They um, are an online publication. You have to be an academic to write for them, but they'll assign you an editor uh, who's a newspaper magazine editor to help you put it in the right shape. The, the brilliance of their model is that they not only give you a great venue to publish it through the conversation where a ton of people will read it, but it's also um, licensed through Creative Commons where anybody else can publish it. So I've done six or seven pieces through the conversation now, some of which get picked up by Newsweek, Salon, uh, you know, various newspapers. So it's really a great way to get your readership up if you, uh, if you start with a place like The Conversation. Okay, uh, so next I'll talk about some of the uh, don'ts in pitching a philosophy op-ed. And some of these just kind of fall into the uh, uh, professionalism, uh, just things uh, just always to remember. Don't quit uh, because you got rejected. It's a numbers game. Uh, you really have to just keep going back again and again and again. It's hard to be rejected. Um, you know, it's hard to get your things peer reviewed and get rejected too. Just remember that you weren't good at that when you started. So just uh, keep after it. Um, second, don't be upset if you're edited. It is impossible to get a philosophy op-ed published without being edited. Um, you have to be willing to uh, revise. You have to be willing to uh, be open to criticism. If you find yourself saying, well, what does this editor know about philosophy? Wrong. Um, you know the philosophy, but the editor knows the audience for the publication that they're interested in. And if you're not open to criticism, if you're not open to revision, you will never get published in those uh, publications. Um, third, uh, this is an obvious one, but it's important for, for uh, people who have been in the academy their whole lives or tenured and you know, don't think this matters. Don't make enemies. Uh, if you are hard to work with, uh, word gets around and you will not be published. Um, if you're easy to work with, then editors will think of you. Both that editor who you've published for before, they'll come to you with something, uh, maybe on a three-hour window, but you know they'll do it. Um, but they will also uh, recommend you to their friends. I've had referrals to people from other publications uh, that's, uh, that's worked out. I did uh, my piece through uh, the conversation and got picked up in Newsweek. Next thing you know, Newsweek asked me to pitch directly to them. Next thing I had uh, the cover of Newsweek. Um, I was overjoyed. It all happened because I was uh, um, professional and uh, nice to people along the way. That, that really helps. A couple of other don'ts. Um, don't forget that you have something to say. Um, it's easy to think, well, you know, I've trained as an academic philosopher. What do I have to say to a general audience? Think about that. Think about what it is important for you to say to a, lot, a, a lay audience. I'll give you an example in my own work. So I work on science denial. Well, you know, right now it's raining buckets for science denial. I can write about coronavirus, climate change. Um, I went to the uh, Flat Earth Convention a few years ago. That was what my Newsweek story was about. So for professional interests, I went to the Flat Earth Convention because I wanted to study science denial in its most elemental form. But wow, were the, was there a popular audience for that kind of article? So I wrote an article about that. Finally, one of the don'ts, um, I would say don't even think about trying to adapt an academic piece. Uh, write something new. Uh, if you've got scholarship on a number of uh, you know, different topics, that's fine. You can maybe write an op-ed on the same topic, but choose an idea that you know is going to work for a popular audience. If, you're, if you've written an academic piece and you think, oh, I could adapt that for a popular audience, you probably can't. Just start with a new piece. So uh, I probably went through that pretty quickly, but I left uh, time for Q&A. Uh, that's what I have. Thank you so much. So maybe we can start with a question from Catherine Womack, which, which was uh, about pitching, but was, a, which was raised earlier. Uh, she writes, I write regularly for a blog, plug, fit is a feminist issue, and have been enjoying using humor in more casual prose. What are your views about pitches that include art or humorous tones? Uh, I, I think that's great. I mean, people, you know, in op-eds, sometimes they want a little snark uh, or, the, or they want a little humor. If it's uh, one of the complaints people have about academic writing is that it's dry. So don't make it dry. Uh, you can, and part of this is paying attention to the language. Um, language can be beautiful. Language can be humorous. You can use sentence fragments. You can, you know, use just one word in a sentence sometimes to get your point across. 
um, play with the language a little bit. Be humorous, be creative. It, it really helps. Again, tone, read it out loud and listen and, and see if it's something that's, um, that you, you know, you'd like to, to read. Uh, I recommend today's column by Frank Grooney. Uh, the tone, the writing, the snark, wonderful. Look at that and use that kind of thing as a model. Again, he's not a philosopher, but he's got the tone and the language just right. Great. Um, uh, Roman Altschuler writes, question about the conversation. I've tried this strategy, but unless you're affiliated with one of their partner institutions, they take weeks to respond. So it seems like you have to pick a topic that's both timely, as that's what they take, but will still be timely in a month. Is that basically the strategy? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can answer that question. They're open to anybody who's affiliated with an academic institution. Um, I work at BU. I didn't realize that they have a fast track, maybe uh, uh, because I, is BU one of their partner uh, uh, publications? I, I don't know how that works. But um, I would say just be persistent, just keep going after it, especially if you ever hear back from an individual editor who maybe passes on one piece. You might say, well, you know, can I pitch you again? Can I write to you again? And then follow up and try the next one. People like that. Uh, pe people, you know, even you might feel like even though they've rejected you twice, well, I can't go back there now. Yes, you can. You can go back uh, many different times. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times I've uh, pitched the New York Times. I got something in there once, but uh, it, it's a long road. <laughs> uh, great. Joanna Smolensky writes, how do you tell what's an appropriate um, Sorry, I need to scroll a little bit. Uh, how do you tell uh, what's an appropriate venue for a piece? I appreciate having to motivate why your piece is a good fit for a particular publication, but at some point it seems like, well, everyone wants their op-ed in the NYT if they accept it. Yeah, it's, it's hard because uh, where do you start? I mean, sometimes you have to, sometimes it helps if you just know the publication. I mean, is it something that you read? Um, you'd be shocked how many people pitch things to publications that they don't read, and it ends up being wildly inappropriate, and they didn't know that because they don't read the publication. So I read The Atlantic, so I have a very good idea of what The Atlantic does. And um, my, you know, they're, they're sort of longer form than the uh, public writing that I do. If I'm going to write long form, you know, I, I want to write a book, so I really haven't pitched to The Atlantic that much. But, uh, but Newsweek, uh, that's shorter form. Uh, that's, I, I've done a, a, a couple of things now for them. So it's, it's hard. I would just say uh, read a lot. Just you know, read a lot of the different publications and, and see what's out there. Uh, everybody wants the New York Times. Everybody wants the Boston Globe. Everybody wants the Washington Post. Um, as somebody said earlier, if, because they all, um, it all has to be exclusive. You know, You start at the top you work your way and then the piece isn't timely anymore. So, some, so uh, sometimes you just have to have enough knowledge of it to know this piece would be perfect for, uh, et cetera. So I had a piece that was perfect for the humanist. So I pitched it to them. I had another piece that was, uh, that was uh, uh, perfect for inside higher ed. So I pitched it to them. Another one, Scientific American. I thought, okay, I read Scientific American. I know this is up their alley. So I pitched it to them. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So uh, Amanda Maxwell writes, how can I persuade the philosophers in my department to write and pitch you know, pu pu public pieces? I guess there's a sort of a general question that a lot of people in PPN are interested in sort of how to make philosophy as an institution more hospitable to public philosophy, more supportive of public philosophy. Uh, so and any pointers on that? Um, I, boy, that's an interesting question, how to get other people in the department to do it. I mean, I'm going to draw the distinction between wanting other people in your department to respect it versus wanting other people to do it. I'm not sure you can <laughs> twist somebody's arm to do it if they, if they don't want to do it. I think the battle, um, uh, and it, it's one that I, I, we're winning, is a respect for public philosophy. I mean, people who understand that, um, you know, it, it, as Jason said, it, it changes your scholarship. And it, at some point, at some level, I've noticed this in my own work, there is no distinction between the work that I'm writing now for the general public and the work that I'm writing for, uh, my, uh, for philosophers. My, my last two books have been very firmly pitched toward a, a general audience, but they had to be philosophically uh, respectable. So I would say the, the battle that we're fighting is a battle for respect. 
if you can figure out how to get other people to do it uh, themselves, that, that's, uh, I, I think that's great. That isn't something that I've really thought about. Uh, great. Well, Lee, thank you so much. This was really yeah. helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And our, our last speaker for today is Regina Rini. Uh, Regina Rini holds the Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Moral and Social Cognition at York University in Toronto. Her research focuses on ethics, social epistemology, and the cultural effects of technology. She has a forthcoming book on the ethics of microaggression and is currently writing a book on social media and democracy. She writes the Morals of the Story column for the Times Literary Supplement and has published op-eds in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. Her essay, The Last Mortals, won the 2018 Mark Sanders Award for Public Philosophy. Welcome, Regina. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, John, for inviting me to do this. So I was asked to talk about generating ideas, and this is actually a useful topic for me because it's a practical problem I have right now. So I, I write this column for the Times Literary Supplement, and I write it every two weeks. And that means that I've got to generate ideas a lot, and they've got to be short term. That is, you know, if, if it's like it's an event in the news, like we've already talked about today, it's got to be pegged to the news, it's got to be a thing people are thinking about right now. So I can't just seed away a bunch of ideas that I'm going to write about later because they won't be newsy by then. And so I I actually have this problem right now where once every two weeks I've got to sit down and decide what is something I can write about about philosophy right now that's useful for public consumption and I've got about two days to turn it around into a 800 to 1200 word column um, and so a couple of suggestions for how you can go about doing this so two different strategies here one is starting from um, from sort of from scratch which is like try to try to figure out what sort of thing you could write about and the other is starting from an idea you already have so starting from scratch the, the strategy I think about think about like the, the what, what's the confused zeitgeist that is what is some idea that's floating around in the air right now that it seems like people don't quite know what to think about they, they, they'd find it helpful to have someone elucidate for them how to think about this complicated problem obviously right now that's coronavirus very very big, big question. Lots of things related to coronavirus. Almost anything you're at right now is probably going to have some connection to that news peg because that's what people are thinking about. But that's always not, always and always going to be the case. Most of the time you're going to do some more work to think about what is an idea floating around in the air right now. If you can't push it abstractly like that, then I have some practical suggestions. One is students. Most of us teach, especially with undergraduates, what are some questions students are asking you, not just about the abstract content of the stuff you're teaching, but about ways it can apply to the real world. Often students are the ones who can generate ideas for you. This is something people would like to hear about. The second, and I, I hate to say this given what I've given the actual research I do, but the second option is social media. Uh, like I said, I don't want to say that because I think social media is generally not good for us, but it's actually really good for somebody who wants to think of ideas for how to write um, something for public consumption because you can just read through Twitter and see what people are interested in right now. And in fact, you can even see here are the things people are saying on social media that are clearly confused. They don't know what they're talking about. They think they're in, they think this important question is is relevant, but in fact, no, 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 they're they're not quite right about that. They're they're um, they they've missed a step in the argument implicitly. I'll give you an example of that in just a second. So those are the two things I would do. Keep tabs on the questions your students are asking you that aren't exactly about the content, but are clearly suggesting applications of the content. And second, you know, read social media. Don't necessarily use it because that could be very bad, but read it, get a sense of what's going on in social media. Okay, so that was one strategy. That's the sort of the, the confused zeitgeist strategy, figure out what's going on. The other is if you've already got a topic, and this is likely to be the case if there's something you write about it professionally, like your academic work, and you want to find a way to make it relevant to the public, most philosophy topics are not relevant to the public at any given time. However, the second strategy is to wait for a peg. So a peg is a term that some journalists use to refer to as a newsy story, something that's in the news right now that gets people thinking that can be used in the first paragraph or two to introduce a more broad question to your audience. So if you've got a topic you're interested in writing about generally, it might be that today, this week, this month, there is nothing in the news that will allow you to peg that because there's no news story that's connected to your topic. But if you start thinking about it in the back of your head and you wait a few months, something might come along. So let me give you one quick example that will illustrate actually both of these things. It was a, by accident, I used both of these strategies at the same time. 
So last year, about in June, um, you might remember there was this art, there was this video that went around on the internet about Nancy Pelosi, and somebody edited it to slow it down to make it look like she was drunk and slurring her words. And I saw people on Twitter, it, it, sorry, one more step in the story, uh, a, a, some journalists, I think it was the Daily Beast, tracked down the origin of this. this. They figured out who did it, the person who, who took the video and manipulated it and released it into the internet. They tracked down the, the source. And so a bunch of people on Twitter were attacking the journalists who did that, saying it's not fair to pick on some random political operative who on his own decided to go and create a, a propagandistic misrepresentation of a politician. It's not fair to pick on this guy because it turned out he was just some guy. He wasn't, you know, Russian military intelligence. He was just some guy. Okay. And so people are saying it's not fair to pick on this guy. And I'm reading people saying that on Twitter and I'm thinking, no, 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 that's a mistake because I've been doing this academic work on deep fakes. I've been thinking about the epistemology of video and audio recordings. I've been working on that project for a few, for two, three years now. And I, in the back of my head, look, the way video and audio are changing these days, knowing the source of a video and audio recording is increasingly important to the epistemology of how we take video and audio recordings. And so I'm sitting there reading on Twitter, people saying, people scolding journalists for tracking down the source of a doctored video. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. That's the wrong example. That's the wrong reaction. We need to encourage journalists to be tracking down this kind of stuff. So, then it occurred to me, wait a minute, this is, I, I shouldn't just be writing angry tweets in response to this. I can actually write an op-ed about this. And so I effectively, I didn't know I was doing this at the time, but what I was doing was using both of these strategies at once. I had in the back of my head this whole uh, philosophical view about the epistemology of deepfakes. And I guess I've been kind of waiting for a chance to express it publicly, although I didn't know that. So I was waiting for a peg implicitly. And I was also generating this sort of confused zeitgeist idea by reacting to something that was going on already, a confusion I saw happening on social media. So that's the idea. Put these two strategies together or use them separately. You can either read a bunch of social media, see what your students are saying, see what the public conversation is, and look for opportunities where you can elucidate and clarify. That's option one. The other is you've already got a strategy in mind and you can sort of hold on to it until there's a moment where some news story gives you an opportunity to present in a way that'll be clear to editors and to readers why they should care about that. I think between those two strategies, you, you, you can kind of cover the gap between you, what you were already thinking about as a philosopher and between what the, what the public is thinking about and wants to hear about. Thank you so much. So um, uh, we've what got one question uh, from Vincent Andriasi, who writes, given the deadlines and short windows, how often do you step outside the handful of areas you might specialize in? Do you wait for something you have expertise in to be in the news if it's not an evergreen topic? If you do step outside those areas, how far do you go? Do you aim to train your philosophical and research skills on a topic about which you may be a novice and gain some fluency in 24 hours, question mark, in three hours, question mark? It's a good question. So uh, if you're already writing a column, um, you kind of don't have a choice. So sometimes I just have to write about something that's not an area I'm a philosophical expert on because I'm committed to writing something every two weeks. Um, and, and that's a challenge and I'm still actually learning how to do it. Uh, but um, if you're not committed previously, I would suggest, especially if it's your first time writing an op-ed, definitely have it be something you know a lot about. I saw a question earlier about grad students. Should graduate students write about something they're writing their thesis on? I think what you really want is kind of the sweet spot. You probably don't want to write about something you're so deeply into that you, you, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore and you won't be able to tell when, um, when you know, you won't be able to tell exactly what is jargon anymore because you've been doing nothing but this for years. Instead, take one step back, do something in your AOS, in your area of specialization. So if you're, if you're writing some narrow topic in epistemology, don't write about that, but write about something else in epistemology, something you could easily teach a, a undergraduate course on. Um, so if you go really far beyond what your training is, you're probably going to screw up. It's probably going to be a mistake. If you focus way too narrowly on the thing that you are already specialized in research, it's probably going to be too close for most people to follow. So find something in the middle, kind of between those two things. That's, that's generally the way I've tried to do it when I can. Uh, great. So this is, a, this is a somewhat personal question. So you can, uh, you know, plead, plead the fifth or decline to answer it. But uh, uh, Catherine asks, how did you get that sweet gig with TLS? Uh, so. Um, yeah, so um, it, it, I, I probably probably not good in a public venue to go into lots of background. Um, but what I can say generally about this sort of thing is it's, it's not like, you know, that 
this is the first thing I've done for public writing. I've been writing for public venues for about five years. Uh, I started with op-eds and from there wrote essays for a couple public venues. And this, this, came, this came about several years into the process. So definitely it's not something you can do if you've never written for the public before, because it is like, uh, it takes up a good amount of my time. Very, very rewarding, but it definitely is starting to, to count as like amount of time I'm doing per week. Um, and it, it's not something you can, let me put it this way, producing a, a column um, is a lot faster than producing your first op-ed because you start learning the rhythms of how to write for that kind of space restriction. Um, so basically the way, I, the way I wound up doing this is just by getting known to editors um, and be, having written, I, I previously wrote for the TLS before, I wrote an essay for the TLS last year, a long form essay that was on the cover. And so I was known to some of the editors there. So that's part of what um, happened in that particular case. But more generally, if your ambition is to be, is to try to do this regularly, the main thing to do is to practice several times with with one-off op-eds to build connections to editors and basically to just be known as somebody who is able to, um, let me put it this way, able to do two things. One is communicate your ideas to the public. The other is to be able to work with the kind of deadlines that journalists work with. We've already heard several times today that the kind of speed of turnaround for journalism is very different from academia. That is absolutely true. And not everybody, I think some journalists and some editors are aware that some academics can't maintain that. And so if you want to be known for this, it's, it's important to be able to a few times demonstrate to folks in uh, outside of academia that this is the kind of thing you're comfortable doing. Okay, I'm 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 gonna give my I'm gonna give myself a question here. So, um, having done a lot of work on the sort of corrupting effects of social media on democracy and on public discourse, I wonder if that ha can has has shed any light for you on um, w ways in which like uh, social media might gamify public philosophy itself or create uh, like perverse or unhealthy incentives for our, our own work as public philosophers? It's a good question. I, I think, um, so it's hard for me to admit. I think social media in general is bad, bad for us, bad democratically. For public philosophy, I think it's probably on balance good. Um, so it, it produces ideas in the way I've mentioned. It gives people a chance to practice getting their ideas uh, developed. A, a great idea, a great, great way to practice is to write Facebook posts. Um, if, 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 assuming if you write on Facebook and you're friends restricted so that not everybody in the world can read your posts all the time, um, that can be a good way to just practice writing in a way that's for short, for like about you know, 800 words. It's a long Facebook post, but it's a good test. If people want to read an 800 word Facebook post, that's a good test. You got a sense as to write an 800 word uh, piece of writing. Um, so it's good for a lot of things. Uh, the way it can be bad, which I'm still figuring out, is that there is a kind of um, uh, peanut gallery effect. There are people who are on the internet who are professional philosophers who will snipe at you for anything you write in a public venue. Some of them I think are, are confused. Some of them I think are opportunistically looking for chances to take shots at people. It's a, it's a mixture. Um, some of them are very, very sincere and just disagree but aren't expressing themselves very politely. There's that whole range. So if you want to write for the public, you have to accept that along the way you're going to get sniped at by, by colleagues who aren't being very nice to you. And there's nothing you can really do about it. Uh, so that's unfortunate. And I, I think this is a collective problem we have. We need to work as a discipline to get used to the idea that some people are going to say things in public that aren't exactly the way I would have them perfectly formulated for an academic journal. But that's not necessarily because they're stupid or, or, or don't know what they're doing. It's because you have to write differently for public venues than you write for academic journals. And so what the real problem here, the real solution here, I think, is ultimately to develop new norms inside of the discipline where we support one another in doing public work rather than operating opportunities to look, up, look for opportunities to bring other people down for expressing ideas the way we wouldn't have done. Thank you so, so much. I uh, thank you to Regina, but I think thank you to uh, all, all of our uh, speakers today. This was really excellent. Um, uh, John scheduled for some concluding remarks. John, you want to <laughs> well, I think one of the I think one of the salient points that came out of this, at, at least in terms of practical um, advice, was the way that uh, uh, the scholarly work that we're doing, the research, um, the journal articles, the book projects, the public uh, uh, conferences, how those feed into and set up a kind of platform for the public writing that you might do. Not that you're going to 
simply push that work into the public without any kind of uh, uh, um, crafting and curating uh, for a public audience, but rather that um, that is uh, that is where we really have to um, make sure that we're developing uh, good scholarly habits and engaging in our research so that we're sort of seeding the soil to develop this kind of public writing. And then I think the other the other side of that is the way that Jason mentioned and also Regina did uh, in in her talk how this public work or this public writing begins to influence the scholarly writing. And I. I uh, I think that was probably one of the most important points that came out of this workshop, uh, and hopefully we'll revisit that uh, in some future workshops to uh, as we try to develop some public writing. Uh, uh, thank, thank you again so much to everybody who's participated here, to all of our speakers, to the super uh, lively and helpful chat here. This has been really good. Uh, we'll, we'll post uh, this video to YouTube later. Uh, we're also planning a series of uh, op-ed workshops through the Public Philosophy Network to actually help workshop to, to help sort of col collaboratively improve on uh, one another's writing for a general audience. So stay tuned to uh, the Public Philosophy Network uh, Facebook group for more information about that. And uh, yeah, thank you again. This was excellent. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.